Hello and welcome back. I've, I, uh, we are here today with Professor Audrey Trushki, who's uh, made some time for us at the Indian Writers Forum despite her very, very busy schedule, and we are very thankful to her for that. Thank you very much for joining us indeed. Thanks for having me. I'm joined in by my colleague uh, and uh, at the editorial collective of the Indian Writers Forum, Ishita, and we'll be discussing Professor Trushki's book and uh, some, of, some of the other uh, issues related to her work on Indian history. So my first question to you is um, an obvious one. Um, what what motivated you to to work on Aurangzeb? Mm. So I think there were a lot of reasons for this. Uh, one is a sort of personal one. I had been thinking about and researching Aurangzeb Alamgir for the better part of a decade, but I had written almost nothing on him. Right, so it was sort of an, a, a sort of obvious place for for my scholarly attention to turn. Um, another reason is that I think that Aurangzeb was in most need of scholarly attention. We have a lot written on Akbar that, that is quite good scholarship. We have a lot written on Dara Shako that Aurangzeb beat out for the throne that's pretty good. But there hasn't been a solid biography of Aurangzeb Alamgir written in decades. And so I thought, why not write it? The third reason I would give is, is a bit more in the sort of popular world, you know, even the political world, which is I made some public comments in writing in a written interview that was printed in the Hindu in 2015. And I said all these things about Akbar that I thought were controversial and no one cared. I've still never heard from anyone about any of that. But I said two lines on Aurangzeb that I thought were not controversial. No scholar would have disagreed with me. And yet I felt like part of the world sort of exploded at me and people were upset for days about this sort of very, very blasé things that I had said about Aurangzeb Alamgir. And I realized at that point that not only is Aurangzeb this political football today, but advances that we've made in our scholarly understanding of him have not been communicated and made available to a wider non-historian audience in India. And so I thought, why not see if, if I can sort of, you know, make one small step into bridging that, that gap. Why do you think it's, it's Aurangzeb who is, who's the most hated Mughal emperor? Mm. So why, why Aurangzeb? Why not hate on Shah Jahan more, right? So I think that one answer goes back to sort of the British period and colonial scholarship slash propaganda, because a lot of it was somewhere sort of straddling a fuzzy line there. Um, but I also think that there are aspects of Aurangzeb's reign that do not sit well with people today, right? And, and many of these are sort of facts that I do not dispute. In fact, I, I admit and discuss and explain in my book. Things like he reinstituted the jizya tax, which is a prejudiced tax. He did destroy some Hindu temples, not the thousands that people go on about, but a few dozen, certainly, right? We, we have evidence for about 10, 12 to 15 confirmed temple destructions, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, looking through a modern lens, if you judge the past by the standards of the present, I think that Aurangzeb comes up a bit shorter than someone like Akbar perhaps does. I do argue in the book that that's not a useful way to look at the past, however, and there is so much more richness in the Indian past to think about and access than whether you happen to like it in 2018, right? And I do think we should use alternative frameworks for talking about history. Um, in fact, as far as uh, alternative frameworks go, um, a part of your research has been on looking at, uh, for instance, uh, your first book, in, in fact, was to look at some of these uh, frameworks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so, and in fact, today your lecture in Delhi was on um, Sanskrit uh, writings or whatever uh, you can call like something that approximates history in Sanskrit literature, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which writes about uh, the, 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 the Mughal kingdom and, and, also other, and also other places. So uh, wh what is it that you think that happened in Indian history, in the writing of Indian history that uh, uh, Persian sources were referred for uh, the writing of the Mughal, uh, for, for writing of the Indian Islamic rule and uh, Sanskrit mm -hmm. sources were ignored? And, why do you think these discrepancies came in in the first place? So that's a great question, right? Because I, I bring Sanskrit sources into my study of the medieval and early modern periods of India quite, quite frequently, but most other people don't. We tend to rely heavily, if not exclusively, on Persian medium sources. So why? I think for written history in particular, there are aspects of, of Indo-Persian historical text from, from the pre-modern period that make it look like history, according to our 21st century definition of history. There's clear names, there's clear dates, for example, right? Um, there are sort of these anecdotes about the past. And so I think it's easy to look at something like that and sort of take it uncritically as true. Oh, this is history, right? This is history sort of like we write history. Um, 
And that's a mistake, not only because it overlooks other archives, but because it misunderstands and, and basically repeats the bias, biases of right. these sources. I also think that there are reasons specific to the study of Sanskrit that has sort of kept Sanskrit sources away from the study of history. Um, even today, most Sanskritists work on things like literature or philosophy or grammar, right? But the idea of a Sanskritist who studies historical sources, th that is a bit rarer. Let me uh, dig into something specific that I came out while I was researching for this interview. And um, uh, a couple of months back, I think uh, you had this uh, tweet and which again, people took a lot of offense to. And uh, this had something to do with uh, your reading of, uh, uh, there was a, there, as far as I remember, there was a um, debate between you and uh, another Sanskritist. And my question is not really about the debate. My question is when you as a, Sanskr as a Sanskritist and a historian debate with other Sanskritists, it's like a fair thing. I mean, it's only to be expected that there'll be debate sure. and discussion. But uh, what I am interested in is the fact that now there's a kind of polarized atmosphere and you know your comments might just be taken out of context or his or her comments might be taken out of context. Does that bother you? Does that affect the debate in some way? So I will begin by saying that scholars disagree with each other all the time, right? In many ways, that's how scholarship progresses, right? Is someone comes up with an idea, someone else comes along and bashes that idea and comes up with a better idea. So I welcome scholarly challenges to my work and I, I celebrate the sort of debate that characterizes academic discourse. I do think it, it, it's a big problem that comments are taken out of context and people's arguments are twisted and misunderstood. Sometimes that's unintentional and sometimes it is malicious. But in either case, it sort of prevents scholarly ideas from going any further, right? It, it sort of stalls the debate and it makes so many of these debates sort of get whittled down to what exactly did someone say? What didn't they say? Should they be allowed to say it? Instead of actually debating the content of the right. ideas, which is what we would all rather be spending our time doing. In terms of, say, something specific to the project on Aurangzeb that you've done. Uh, so uh, your book is, in fact, pitted against this kind of the evil Aurangzeb, the horrible Aurangzeb, the, the, this, this, whatever. I can't use these words in interviews, but you know, it's a variety of words used for him, and he's like really the most hated figure. Uh, does that? Uh, prevent you in some way from really engaging with the historical figure of Aurangzeb? Because you, what you are trying to say is, you're trying to look outside of these binaries of the bad Muslim, good Muslim, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, but just the fact that there is this whole baggage of this uh, misreading or reinterpretation of Aurangzeb, does that, does that hinder scholarly discourse or scholarly work in any way? Mm, I think most definitely it does. Um, and sort of in a couple of different ways. One is that it makes it more difficult to talk to an audience because you always have to go through the present. And I mean, that's true of all history, but when that present is so weighed down by this baggage, there's just more more that you have to go through. There's more legwork that you have to do before you can even start talking about a historical figure. Mm -hmm. I think the other way that it sort of comes into and works against academic work is that I live in 2018 too, right? right? I am not some objective, you know, fully objective person sitting above everything. Uh, you know, we strive for objectivity as historians. I think it's a useful ideal to strive for but we can never fully achieve it. And so I am influenced too by these ideas, right? We, we all sort of carry certain ideas in the back of our mind and I participate in society just like everyone else. And so an important part of the scholarly project is being aware of your own biases, right? And trying to keep those in check. And in theory, you know, what I would love to be able to do is to 100% identify what all of that is and then be able to sort of hold it on the side and work forward. I think it would be hubris to say that I succeed in that. But I nonetheless strive to be critical and, and keep, keep going for that goal nonetheless. Could you just explain for our viewers, because this is just something that, uh, um, that, that requires an explanation uh, for like a general audience. How do you actually evaluate historical sources? How is, how is that made? How is that evaluation made? What is, what is different when you say that, okay, I'm, I'm trying to use a different archive to build this argument? Mm. So, so like for, uh, if, you, if you were to think that you were trying to explain it to someone who's not, who, who is a non-specialist, how would you explain? Right, so I think w one of the first things that you do is you interrogate your sources, right? You ask who wrote this? When did they write it? How close were they to the events in question? Why did they write it? What did they stand to gain from lying or twisting the truth? How did they write it? Is this poetry that comes with certain conventions? Is this worked into some sort of narrative where there are expectations? And you sort of, sort of put that all together, right? And then sort of draw what conclusions you can. 
And you know, I think that there's a tendency to look at you know a text written 400 years ago and say, oh well, you know they lived and they saw it. It must be true. Yeah. And an example that I give to my students because I teach South Asian history in the United States to sort of get them to see this is I use the example of Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. When you go on Twitter and you read Donald Trump's tweets, you don't assume that they're true, do you? Right? Only a chump would, would make that sort of assumption. And so you, know, you ask yourself, OK, well, what does he stand to gain by denying the Russia involvement or whatever the situation is? right? Um, and so you want to do all of that. You really want to interrogate your sources and contextualize them and situate them. Another thing that we do as historians is we weigh evidence against one another. And we often come up with conflicting sorts of evidence, right? Sometimes someone will say, this situation went this way, and someone else will say, well, it happened an entirely another way. A good example of that from my work is when Shivaji shows up at Aurangzeb's court in 1666. Mm -hmm. Everyone writes about this. We have a bunch of different accounts. They all agree that the meeting didn't go well. But what exactly happened at court and why is the subject of much debate at mm -hmm. the time. I guess the final thing I would say on this is sort of just a word about the limits of history, right? As a historian, I am limited by my sources to a great degree, right? I read them every which way I can, against the grain, I weigh them against one another, but at the end of the day, history does not tell you everything about the past. It's sort of, you know, you sort of get light shining through the dark curtain, as it were, but you can't know everything. And so in the case of, say, Shivaji at Aurangzeb's court, I don't know exactly what happened there. I have a sort of general picture that everyone agrees upon, but the specifics, all I can give you are the different stories. I cannot fully adjudicate that question. In fact, uh, let me just stop you there. And, and a lot of your sources and your history writing is really a, about a time which is pre-modern, which is, but you're doing it in a kind of modern age now. Correct. So a lot of the ways in which maybe you're trolled or whatever is that you're used, uh, like th these are really modern terms that are used, that, oh, he was a Hindu ruler, he was against Hindus, and this was against Muslims. But you know, these terms, as we all know, by a, even a cursory reading of history, I'm no historian or some, uh, I, mean, I mean, I claim no scholarship in this, but I mean, we know that these hi Hindus, Muslims, these were not terms that Aurangzeb might have even used. Or no, I mean, these Correct. were not, terms that were used at that time in the first place. I mean, they, people didn't associate or uh, know each other as Hindus and Muslims, or they had probably other identities. Absolutely. So, so uh, what is the problem that you, not really the problem, the problem comes, do you, do you think there's a problem when the Hindu right sort of uses some of these terms, uh, which were not even prevalent in the time, and then sort of, you know, blows it out of proportion? Absolutely, and I, th I think there what you really see is the sort of politicized reading of history, mm -hmm. right? Or the, I would just say the politicized reading of the past, right? You have politically based claims about the past and then historically based claims about the past. And the politically based ones are not history at all. They're mythology, right? Mm -hmm. They're nothing more. They hold absolutely no weight so far as someone like me is concerned. Um, and, you know, w when historians like me come along and we point out these things, you know, Hindu is really a word that comes to be used in the modern time. Hindus, Hindus did not refer to themselves as such, generally speaking, in pre-modern times. This was not Hindu-Muslim conflict. It was about other identities. Mm -hmm. One reason why you don't see that sort of being picked up by people is that when you displace the modern identities, you displace the politics of the past. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is something that I am interested in doing. Mm -hmm but that nullifies much of the Hindu rights interest in the past at all. I was wondering if you think that this demonizing of Muslim rulers has, has grown uh, stronger over the last few years. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I think uh, one way to see that is to look at the example of Akbar. Right, so it used to be that Aurangzeb was the bad Muslim, but Akbar was the good Muslim, and that was okay. And now you're increasingly seeing attacks on Akbar too, right? Whether it's through openly maligning him in comments or through changing the outcome of the Battle of Haldi Ghati in the Rajasthani textbooks, mm -hmm. right? And one sort of modern takeaway from that is I think that some people justify hateful discourse by saying, in the case of the Hindu right, let's say, well, we're not against all Muslims. We're just against a certain kind of Muslim. And as long as, you know, just the bad ones. And as long as you're the good one, it's okay. But you are really living in a fool's paradise if you think that hatred can stop like that, right? Hatred tends to expand and encompass more and more as time goes on. And you're seeing that now, where the good Muslim, bad Muslim dichotomy in certain respects is starting to crack because all Muslims are starting to look bad from the perspective of Hindutva. You've made this claim in several places, and in fact, your book on Aurangzeb also, uh, it mentions that it was actually the colonial historiography that saw India as this Hindu-Muslim uh, divide, and they were the ones who sure. 
who brought in this thing. So do you think that the colonial, uh, uh, sorry, the Hindu right now actually relies a lot on colonial and orientalist historiography uh, to make some of the claims that they make? Yes, I think they do, but I don't think that they're particularly aware of that. Okay. I think that that takes a sort of awareness about history and historiography that, that I'm not willing to attribute to the Hindu right because I don't see evidence of it. Um, you know, and they use it for different reasons, and I think that that's important, right? For the British, this was part of a divide and conquer strategy, and it was part of a self-justification of the colonial enterprise strategy. The Hindu right is not trying to divide and conquer, nor are they trying to justify British colonialism, obviously. They're trying to do something different, right? It's a different sort of divide and rule and divide by way, divide in order to create Hindu unity of a certain brand, right? Um, so the sort of, the mechanism seems to have continued, but the goals and objectives, those have changed. Right. Uh, my final question to you, uh, we were like on our way here, you were talking about your experience of India, uh, before whatever con controversy happened. Uh, but uh, do you like coming here still? And uh, how has your relationship to the land been, like the space itself? Mm. So I do, I love coming to India. Um, I find it a fantastic country to visit. And in general, I find it a very warm and welcoming country as well. Things like the Hyderabad controversy notwithstanding. All right, that's a wrap from us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, I thank hope you. For you me. Yeah, I, I I know that you have a couple of more lectures lined up. We really hope it goes well, and uh, hopefully we'll have you more in our studio, and uh, not not always as a reaction to whatever happens, <laughs> but probably talk more about history. I uh, hope so. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Make sure that you watch the interview that we did prior to this, where she explains what happened at Hyderabad. But uh, yeah, and uh, make sure that uh, we'll we'll have the description to that interview in the descriptions uh, in the descri in the YouTube description of this particular one. Make sure you watch that and you please uh, subscribe and like and do what you need to do to make sure that you keep getting more content from us. Thank you very much for watching.